2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from 6 through 8, and verse 8 is going to be our text tonight. Now, we've covered some things already relating to verse 8 in chapter 2 and verse 5 and chapter 4 and verse 1, and maybe a few verses uh, in review, but uh, I still want to just camp out in this verse here tonight. He said in verse 6, Paul writing to Timothy and speaking uh, encouraging him in verse 5, and then in verse 6, 7, 8, gives his own testimony. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that... Um, but to all them also that love his appearing. Lord, we thank you again for this day and this evening. We ask your blessings upon our time together, and we ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to title this here tonight, The Crown of Righteousness. Again, we dealt with this somewhat in chapter 2 and verse 5. We dealt with the Lord's coming in, uh, here in verse 1 of this chapter. And we've spoken many times over the years on crowns and rewards. Earlier this year in March, we uh, preached out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, and we titled that uh, Running the Race. But here we find tonight uh, the rewards for faithfulness. The Apostle Paul is speaking of his conflict in verse 6 and 7. He speaks of the fact that he's ready to be offered. The time of his departure was at hand. He said in verse 7, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. And then in verse 8, he speaks of the crown of righteousness. He said in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but, all, but unto all them also that love is appearing. I'll just take a few of the words here, and again, some of these we've already covered beginning in verse 1. We looked at the judgment and the coming of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord, uh, the charge that was given to Timothy. But in verse 8, in view of what he said in verse 6 and 7, he said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The conflict in Paul's life was now coming to an end. And what remains is a crown. When he uses this word henceforth, he's looking beyond death now. He's looking to the happiness of the future, and he's looking to that crown that he would receive. So he's coming to the end of his life. He said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. This ideal of being laid up carries the ideal of being safely stored and safely guarded. And two passages, I'm not going to turn to them, that would kind of bring this out would be 1 Timothy 6, verses 18 through 20, and also Matthew 6, verses 19 through 20. To be laid up. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. We come to the subject here. Well, let's back up and read in chapter 1, first of all. Notice in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul was totally persuaded that he was going to get this crown. He was confident that he was saved with the grace of God, but he was also confident that he was going to receive a crown. As we read through the Bible, we find others that were had that confidence and that persuasion, in Romans 4.21, uh, we see that Abraham uh, had that same confidence. He was persuaded that God was going to do exactly what he said he would do. And also in Hebrews 11, verse 13, the Old Testament saints that had not received the promise, uh, you know, the, the inheritance and whatever, they were waiting for that, uh, they also had that confidence, used the word persuaded. In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul here says in verse 11 and 12, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles, 
For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. Here's this word. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That day is the coming of the Lord. Back in chapter 4, he speaks here of a crown of righteousness. Again, you can make note of chapter 2 and in verse 5, he mentions the crown that those will receive for being faithful, for following the rules. So he speaks of this crown of righteousness here. We're going to, I'm going to, won't read them all, but I'll give you the verses again on crowns and rewards and prizes. So Paul was confident that he was saved. He was confident that he was going to get a crown for his service. And that's a great promise to God's people. I would serve him if there were no crowns ever mentioned in the Bible or rewards, but this is nice that God has done this. This has given us something beyond just being saved. And it's called here, it's called many different things in the Scripture, but here it's called a crown of righteousness. It is a righteous crown won in the cause of righteousness. In other words, in the cause of of holy living. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Back in verse 1, we spent again some time on judgment and the Lord's coming and the kingdom. Those were the three things that we focused in on. But I'm going to read just a few verses, and um, I'm going to read in the book of Acts, if you want to turn there with me. When we talk about the righteous judge, notice women in Acts chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse uh, 38, 38 through verse 43. We find as we read through the book of John that judgment was committed to the Lord, to the Son. You'll find that in chapter 5, verse 28 through 30, and also chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. We also find this here in the book of Acts. In the book, book of Acts here, we, we're going to read about it in chapter 10. The last time we looked at this, we also considered chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. We find that they calls upon all to repent, for the day is coming when the Lord Jesus shall come back and he shall judge. He says here in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, a reference to Christ. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. And he says here in verse 43, he said, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Of course, verse 44 through 48, Peter and those that were with him were saved by the grace of God. But in verse 42 again, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. We find here that the Lord Jesus is that righteous judge that all will stand before one day. Again, we see this in many other places. Another place would be Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 23. Now he mentions in our text receiving a crown of righteousness and then the righteous judge shall give it that day. We spent some time on this as we were in verse 1 of the chapter, but notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll give you just a few verses on that before we consider anything else. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading in verse 7 and 8, we find that day, the day of the Lord, mentioned many times in the New Testament. And it just has to do with Christ's coming. And at at His coming, there will be a resurrection of the dead, and then there will be judgment. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, verse 7 and 8, and again, if you're taking notes tonight, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, that day is mentioned. And give you one of the passages, and again, there's a multitude of them, but Philippians 1, verse 6, and in verse 10. But here, verse 7 and 8, speaking to the church at Corinth, he said in verse 7, So that you become behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of His coming and those who are waiting for Him. Now go back with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll make one other reference here and then we'll turn loose of this verse and consider some others. He says here again, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So this promise is not only to Paul, but it's to each and every one of us here tonight. Those that love his appearing, those that are looking with anticipation for the Lord's coming. And to give you an example of this, I'm going to give you three different passages on this. One is Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. We find that Simeon, and in the context there, Anna as well, but Simeon was waiting for the first coming of Jesus Christ. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, which was the Messiah coming to save them from their sins. And God even gave him a promise that he would see the Messiah before his death. And you remember the story there in the temple that he was able to, uh, to uh, pick up the Lord Jesus and gave a prophecy uh, about some things that would take place. So Simeon, Anna, Mary, um, Zacharias, and Elizabeth, many were waiting and looking for the coming of the Lord. The same concept is for you and I. We find that the Corinthians, uh, there were those that were looking for His coming. And I'll give you two other passages you can write down. We turned to one of these recently. But uh, in Second Peter chapter 3, uh, probably verse 12 would be the verse, but the surrounding text is important. The surrounding text uh, is the day of the Lord, shall so come as a thief in the night speaks of the things that would take place, and he tells us to have a holy conversation. Then he said in verse 12, "...looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat." And then he talks about verse 13, "...new heavens, new earth." And then again, he's telling the Christians to live uh, and be without spot and blemish. But we see here the looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Then another passage uh, you can jot down would be uh, 3 John. Uh, We read part of this this morning in the context we were uh, preaching on. But in chapter 3, 1 John 3, in verse 1, we're called the sons of God. Verse 2, he said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then in verse 3, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Again, that's the looking with anticipation, waiting for the Lord, living righteously before Him. You can turn loose of 2 Timothy and go with me to the book of uh, Philippians. And, and Philippians chapter 3, and notice here. Now again, some of these we've looked at already in our series in Timothy. I'm going to read a few and just give you a few. 
So when we get to thinking about heaven and thinking about our eternal destiny, thinking about Christ's coming, the resurrection of all the saints, we think about the crowns and rewards that God has promised to us, it brings uh, warm feelings to our heart, does it not? And that's how that the Apostle Paul, even in the prison cell, that he could say the things that he did. He had finished his course. He is coming to the end of his life, but he knew what remained. His conflict was over. The battle was over. The struggle was over. And he knew that he was going to receive a reward. Uh, the, the pursuit of Christ was Paul's life, seeking the future, forgetting the past, and embracing the present. That was Paul's life, and it should be our life as well. I've read this to you before, speaking of crowns. It said, an old man could not carry a tune, but he loved to sing and loved to say amen a lot. Four of the men of the church went to see him and to tell him not to sing. He was plowing and said to them, when I think of them robes, beautiful palace and crowns, I just want to say something. As a matter of fact, would you hold my mule? I feel like singing. And they left him in the field singing and later they learned to appreciate him. And when we get to thinking about, again, the crowns, the beautiful palace, all of the things that God has for us, the righteous robes, the resurrection uh, of the body, and all of the things, the new heavens, new earth, new city, new Jerusalem, again, it brings, it put a smile on our face, will it not? Well, notice here in Philippians, in the book of Philippians, I'm going to be reading in verse 14. Now, if you're taking notes tonight, I'm going to give you the verses, especially some of those that we've just um, if not weeks ago, at least a few months ago that we gave. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, speaks in particular of the judgment seat of Christ. And it's for believers to examine their service, not their salvation. It has to do with crowns and rewards. Again, the judgment seat of Christ is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. If you look at the surrounding context, verses 1 through 11, again, we see that there's going to be those that are rewarded. There will be suffer uh, loss there for some. And then the other passage we just read, I know within weeks ago, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 17, goes into details, again, about receiving these rewards. And again, there are those who will suffer loss as far as rewards is concerned if they have not served the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, and the context speaks of faithful stewards and the mysteries of God, again, to be rewarded. Well, in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul speaks of the fact that he's, uh, he's uh, seeking uh, the Lord with all of his heart. In verse 13 and 14, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We see his, uh, his goal was forgetting those things that are behind, and again, embracing the present, living in the present, and, and looking unto the future as he would be crowned and rewarded. And the Apostle Paul was one, and I believe that we can say the same thing. He was one, he knew that he was saved by the grace of God. But he also knew as he was coming to the end of his life, he knew positively that there was a crown of righteousness that was waiting for him. He knew that as well as he was saved. And I believe that every saint of God can know the same thing as they come to the end of their life as well. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, again we see the apostle's heart and his goal. We're going to have the word prize and crown mentioned here. I'm going to be reading verse 24 through 27. 27. 
And again, as we go along here, I'm going to give you some other verses. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20 speaks of a crown of life or a crown of rejoicing. The Apostle Paul even rejoiced in the people he ministered to. Um, we also find in Colossians 3, verse 22 through 25, of these rewards that we will receive. James 1, 12 speaks of a suffering crown, the crown of life. Peter, in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4, speaks of the crown of glory. Some people call that the shepherd's crown because in that particular place he is talking about pastors. Revelation 2.10, a crown of life to the faithful, to those that serve him. Chapter 4 and verse 10, a crown. Chapter 11 and verse 18, he promised clearly that they would receive a reward. In verse 18 of chapter 11, the, the judgment will come up on the unrighteous and the righteous will be rewarded. Chapter 3, i make sure I got this right. Revelation 3, uh, 11 says, Yes, behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So again, these are promises that we have in the Word of God. Chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Again, Paul is dealing here with not, you know, whether we're saved or not, but he's dealing here with the fact of crowns and rewards. Chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things, that is, self-control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And he's talking about, uh, here again, he did not want to be disapproved by the Lord when it comes to crowns and rewards. Notice in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 57 and 58. The entire chapter is dealing with the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the saints. But he says here in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 57 and in verse uh, 58. He closes this chapter this way. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything that we do for Christ is not in vain. He has promised that he will bless us for that one day. Well, I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to read three different passages in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible tells us in 2 John, verses 7 through 11, that we serve him to receive a full reward. That means that rewards can be lost. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, we're told to occupy till he comes. And as you read the surrounding context, when the Lord does come, he will reward his servants. Matthew 25, 23 says, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. That's not the entire verse. But again, there are those who, when the Lord comes, they will be rewarded. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 is the, is the um, chapter dealing with the faithful of the Old Testament. They received a good report card in verse 2 and also later in the chapter. But notice as we come here to verse 6, now I just made reference earlier to verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, 
But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Uh, they were persuaded. They embraced these things. They believed them. They believed God's word. Well, notice in verse 6 of chapter 11, and again, a whole chapter is dealing with faith. And he said in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is a rewarder. He has promised this, and we can count on it. Amen. Notice in chapter uh, in chapter 12, I want to read here, and then this connects with chapter 11. you got the great cloud of witnesses. That is all of the people in chapter 11. And notice here, again, this is the text we preached from in March, titled, uh, Running the Race. But notice, I'm coming to verse 1 and 2. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses. Again, this is all the saints of chapter 11. He said, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, that, in other words, that which hems us in and hinders us, and he said, And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He goes on in the next few verses to talk about this as well. But in verse 1, Wherefore, in view of all of chapter 11, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses. We have many testimonies in the Old Testament uh, of faithfulness. And we can read about those who had great victories, those who had great struggles, uh, those who lived uh, and, and, had, uh, and conquered enemies, but also those who died and suffered, those who lived in caves, even those who lived in palaces, we have all of these and uh, that are mentioned. They're called a great cloud of witnesses. But he said in verse 12, let us lay aside every weight. In other words, anything that would weight us down, anything that would slow us down in this race. You never see runners filling their pockets full of marbles or, or rocks. They never carry things that's going to weight us down. So anything that would hinder us and slow us or weight us down from serving the Lord. He says, uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. That is mainly the sin of unbelief. Then he says, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul talked about a fight. He talked about the faith, but he also talked about a race. He said, I've finished my course. And we're all in this race. We're not running against each other, but we're in this race. And again, God has told us how to run this race. And he's told us that we will receive a reward at the end. Now, one other passage, chapter 6. Notice with me in chapter uh, 6 this time. And I'm going to read from verses 9 through verse 12. Verse 9 through 12. Again, God keeps His promises. And, and this passage clearly shows us that. Verse 9 through 12. The first three verses is speaking of the believer. Speaking of uh, the doctrine of Christ and the believer and teaching us that we are to uh, go forward in our Christianity. In verses 4 through about 8, ex maybe except for one verse, it's speaking of the apostate, the doctrine of Christ, and the apostate, the unfaithful. But he comes back in verse 9 and begins speaking to the believer again. And he said in verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, 
though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I read all of that for, for especially verse 10. God is not unrighteous to forget our work and our labor and that we have ministered to the saints and do minister. He's not forget any of that. He will never forget it. He has promised that not only has He saved us, but He will reward us one day for our faithfulness. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we do thank You again tonight for this day that You have given us. And Lord, we ask now Your blessings upon the singing, the prayer request, and the closing prayer tonight. We ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.